Pam. That goes perfect with my message today. <laughs> it's amazing how the Lord brings the songs together and uh, as well as the scriptures that we, we bring before you. What a blessing. Take your Bibles, would you please, and turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 4. We're almost coming to the conclusion of uh, our series on 1 Peter, the blessed life, the life that is a blessing, and we have um, found some wonderful, wonderful truths through the Word of God found in 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 4, and we're going to begin reading in verse 12. Would you stand with me in reverence of reading God's Word? Peter said, Beloved, do not drink or do not think it is strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceedingly joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you. For the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he has blasphemed. But on your part, he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or a busybody in other, other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffer as, Christ, or as Christians, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And it begins with us first. What will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God Commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. That last verse is a very important verse. Let's read it once again. Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. Father, we're so grateful and thankful for the day that we're able to pick up this blessed book and to be able to read and to understand even some of the things that we find ourselves going through. Sometimes we find ourselves in the midst of suffering. Sometimes we find ourselves in a crisis, in a situation, and we say, where is God? And yet, you're there all the time. And that you're teaching and you're training and you're developing and you're fulfilling your ultimate purpose in our lives. Help us, dear Lord, to have a better understanding of that today. Thank you, dear Lord, for your blessed word. May the anointing and the filling of your spirit will be upon the preaching of your word. For your honor and for your glory, that is our prayer today. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm thankful that they've got, they've got me a, a chair up here again today. Uh, I, uh, I don't know whether you enjoyed it or not, but I enjoyed it last <laughs> week. It was always 
almost uh, too comfortable there for a moment. But uh, when I stand for a long period of time, my back really begins to bother me and it begins to hurt. And so uh, somebody suggested about me sitting down. I thought, well, you know, that's not a bad idea. And so uh, I'm going to be sitting for today and maybe for next Sunday or two. But uh, anyway, I want to talk to you today about a subject that every one of us go through. Somehow, some way, some place, we all experience some type of suffering. Now, some types of sufferings are more severe than others, of course. Some go through suffering in a period of a, a matter of a long period of time than others. So all sufferings are not the same. And we sometimes want to ask the question, why suffering? What is the purpose? What, what does God have in mind when we find ourselves going through a trial, going through a suffering? Uh, think about the man that Pam talked about that had cancer in the eye. I'm sure he probably asked the question, why? Why the eye? And why me. We all have asked that question sometimes. So it reminded me about a man one time who was on this train. And this train was going through, his, this was a number of years ago, down back in the Midwestern part of the uh, United States. And it was an old train, and uh, it would go through a certain town but it would not stop at that town. And this guy that was sitting there in the, uh, in the uh, car of that train was talking to this gentleman beside of him, and he says, you know, he said, I wish the train would stop at this town. He said, because uh, the next stop that it lets people off, I get off there, and it takes me almost $100 to pay for a taxi to get back to that town. And the guy says, well, you know, he said, I know exactly the place you're talking about. He said that uh, it does slow down at that town. And he said that, uh, i tell you what we'll do. He says it slows down to pick up the mailbag. And I tell you what we'll do, I'll put you out the window and put you down on the platform and you won't have to worry about going to the next town. So they come to this little town. The train slows down. The guy picks up this little guy and puts him on the uh, uh, platform. He says, now remember when you about to step off, run as fast as you can because if you don't, you're going to fall face first when you hit the ground. So sure enough, everything was going fine. The guy picks him up, sticks him out the window, and there's those little stubby legs. He was running as fast as he could and he, as he hit that platform, and he just waves goodbye to that man. Well, there was a guy in the back of the train saw the guy. He reaches out and he picks up the man, pulls him back in. He says, today's your lucky day. You almost missed the train. Well, sometimes things happen that just doesn't turn out the way that we think that it should. Peter says something that I think is imp important for us to remember. He says that I don't want you to think it's strange when you suffer. Well, that's strange to be mentioning that. Because we all think it's strange. It's not normal. And so the Bible talks about that we're not to be surprised when the fiery trial that is to come upon us. I think about in church history, 
Nero, in 64 AD, he burned Rome down and he blamed it on the Christians. And tremendous amount of persecution was placed upon those Christians. And there, many of them were crucified by Nero. Many of them were set on fire and burned as human candles, placed on poles to light up the streets. Many of them was thrown into animal skin bags that uh, with rats that they would eat them literally alive. Many of them were thrown to wild dogs. And there they would just literally be persecuted one right after the other. Terrible, terrible time. If you were a Christian, my friend, you experienced suffering during that time like history had never seen before. Suffering. What about our day and time? How do you explain hurricanes, tornadoes? How do you explain cancer? How do you explain COVID? How do you explain all these things that infiltrate our society? Well, you may be surprised, but it's a part of God's plan. God has a plan, and he has a purpose that he can only do certain things through suffering. So what I'd like to do is to examine that for a few moments. I want us to take the scriptures and just go verse by verse and just begin to see how the scriptures define suffering. First of all, you'll notice there in verse 12, the the reasons for suffering. Reasons. I think that as he begins to lay before us the Apostle Peter, he lays objectives and reasons for those suffering. First of all, what he does, he says it purifies us. Notice what the Bible says. It says, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you. The fiery trial trial. The verb of trial is a word that is used to describe the refining of metal in a refiner's fire. In other words, it's in, not in order to destroy the metal, but it is literally to purify the metal. It is to cleanse the metal. It's to take the dross and all of its impurities away from the piece of metal. So what God's doing when he puts us in a fire, he's using a furnace, a furnace to purify us. Someone says, if you, if you have big faith, comes a big furnace. If you have small faith, comes a small furnace. And God says, through his word, that it's literally a compliment when God looks upon you that he thinks that you are worthy to be able to go through the fire for his purpose and for his reasoning. A little fire, a little faith. A big fire, a big faith. Someone once said that if your faith cannot be tried, it must not be much. And so therefore, my friend, I want us to think about it. Heard about a guy one time, he lived next door to an atheist. And this uh, atheist and this guy had planted a pumpkin patch. And rather strange, the atheist pumpkin patch flourished. 
But the Christians, pumpkin patch, it spoiled and was ruined. And the atheist, rather obnoxious, looked at the Christian. He said, ah, if your God was so, if he cared for you so much, why didn't your pumpkin patch do well? And then the man, that wise old gentleman said, well, listen, God's not in the business of growing pumpkins. He's in the business of growing Christians. And isn't that true? God knows whether we're worthy or not to whether we're to be able to, to suffer for his name's sake. So it sometimes, it purifies. It takes away all the impurities. Anything that would, does not look like the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't it amazing that when you go through a period of suffering, you, t- you go through a period of self-examination, you begin to examine yourself, And you began to think, is there something in my life that should not be there? And if the Holy Spirit would remind you of something, that you then began to immediately confess it, repent from it. Where had you not gone through that, you may have neglected of coming to that point of repentance. So God sometimes allows us to go through a period of suffering because it purifies us. But secondly, not only that it purifies us, but it identifies us. Listen to what the Bible says in verse 13. As you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, as you are a partaker of Christ's suffering. In other words, God is saying that when you suffer, you look a lot like the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we, of course, we know as we study the Gospels of the suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ, he not only suffered on the cross, which was so evident as we read the story about the cross. But he suffered even before the cross. Foxes have holes. Birds have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Suffering. He was looked down upon. He was spit upon. He was bruised and beaten and yet never committed a sin. Suffering is beyond our understanding of all that he experienced. Physical, mental, spiritual, that the Father himself had to turn his... his, uh, face away from the Lord Jesus Christ when he became sin. My God, my God, can you not hear the suffering? My God, why hast thou forsaken me? You, you, you see it as you read it in the scriptures. You, you can feel the pain. And the Lord's saying, now that you are a Christian, Christ-like, nothing identifies you more with me than suffering. How we respond is so important. We respond in a matter that Christ, in the way that Christ responds. Paul put it this way. He said, that I may know him and that I may know the fellowship of his sufferings. 
that I may know him. In all the fullness and the glory of God, I cannot understand that unless I come to a point of understanding his sufferings. And Paul says, I count it worthy that I may suffer for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it purifies you. It identifies you. But it also glorifies you. Listen to what the Bible says once again in verse 13. He says that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. You may be glad with also exceeding joy. That joy means uh, uh, an overflowing, a bubbling joy. Something that cannot match the feeling. It's amazing how God ties suffering and glory together. You go back and you study the scriptures and you'll find of how God tied sufferings and glory with the, the sufferings of, of uh, Christ on the cross. Jesus suffered for sin. The glory is we've been forgiven of sin. We've been cleansed of sin because the price has been paid in full. The sufferings of Jesus of dying and placed in a grave, the glory of the resurrection, the new life that would have never been a resurrection had there not been a death. There would have never been forgiveness. The glory of forgiveness and cleansing had there not been a price that was paid. So Jesus, as he came, he walked the pathway of suffering so that you and I might experience the glory. Glory to come, but glory today. My friend, one day we'll go to be with the Lord in heaven, and oh, what a day that will be. A glorious, glorious day. There's a gospel song, an old gospel song, and one of the lyrics, it says this, Oh, that will be glory for me when by his grace I shall look at his face. That will be glory. Can you imagine? <laughs> One of these days we'll be able to see the Lord Jesus Christ face to face without any hindrance of sin, without any hindrance of the world, of Satan, but see his face. Won't that be glorious? But my friend, I want you to understand, there can be glory today. That's right. I think about Simon Peter as he was talking about this passage of Scripture that he probably had in mind of old Stephen. You remember Stephen being flogged by a bunch of rocks? As they stoned him, they said his face was like a Christ. All the glory of God, or his face was like an angel, excuse me. His face was like an angel, and that 
the glory of God was upon him in the moments of his suffering. You go back into the Old Testament and you read about the tabernacle. And there you would read about the glory cloud. And the glory cloud would be is that there would be a glory cloud over the tabernacle. And that was a sign that God's presence was upon that tabernacle. <coughs> I've gone in hospital rooms. We're a saint of God who have suffered fearlessly in a manner of maybe cancer or some type of deadly disease. And their body would be wrecked with pain. But their face would be like a face of an angel. The glory of God. So, you, do you not see that the pathway to glory is the path of suffering? Without suffering, there will be no glory. And so, therefore, what suffering does, it identifies us. Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 18, for I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed to us. Not worthy. That shall be prepared, be revealed to us. I love to read about John Wesley and some of those old men of God that who served God for many, many years and was used of God in a special way. And on this particular day, John Wesley was preaching in an open-air uh, revival. And there was two old atheists, infidels, you might would say, hated John Wesley. And they had one ambition, and that ambition was to go and to um, break up that service and bring harm against John Wesley. They went there, and something happened. As John Wesley was preaching, these men were spellbound. One looked at his, his friend and he said, that, that is not a man. And a few minutes later he says, yes, he is a man. He is a man of God. The glory of God that fell upon John Wesley. Came upon him, and even an old infidel could recognize the glory of God. My friend, when the glory of God falls upon you, you don't have to tell anybody. Being filled with the Spirit of God the anointing of God, the glory of God. So what does it do? Suffering, it purifies us. Suffering identifies us. Suffering glorifies us. But did you realize that we have responsibilities when suffering comes our way? Now, I want you to notice something I think is rather interesting. The Bible says in verse 15, he says, but let none of you suffer. 
In other words, he's talking about Christians, and he begins to name four things as a murderer or as a thief or an evildoer or a busybody. Now, you stop and you think about that. You mean a Christian could be a murderer? You mean a Christian can be an evildoer? A thief? My friend, without the help of the Holy Spirit and his presence in your life, you can do anything that sin would bring to your attention. That's why it's so important that we live in the Spirit, walk in the Spirit, that we don't become one of these things that the world knows as a sinner. But you know what? There's a lot of people that gets out of the will of God. They walk away from the fellowship of God. And because of that, they bring suffering into their life. They bring suffering to their family. They bring sufferings to their church. They bring suffering to their friends. And if they're not careful, they'll say, oh, I'm suffering for the cause of Christ. This is what Peter has said. He said, let, let no Christian say that. You have responsibilities, my friend. When suffering comes your way, God may be convicting you or God might just be encouraging you. Some of the greatest people that has ever been used of God have gone through suffering, have gone through periods of great, great hurt and pain. But then there's people that's out of the will of God, walking out of the fellowship of God and experiencing sufferings in their life, and then they turn around and say, well, God is just using me to glorify him. That's a, that's a flat-out lie. That's what Peter is talking about. So therefore, when we have sufferings that comes into our life, we ought to recognize that there are certain responsibilities. But then thirdly, look with me in verse 19, the results of our suffering. He says, wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God. Did you see that? According to the will of God. And then he goes on to say, commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. In other words, you commit yourself you commit your life to God. He says in verse 18, commit your souls unto him as unto a faithful creator. The word commit is a banking term. You take something that is very valuable and you deposit it in something that you know that will safeguard it. You take your money and you deposit it in a bank. You're committing that money. He is saying that the most, most valuable thing that you have is your soul, that you commit it to the Lord. When suffering comes our way, what do we do? We need to make, first of all, that we're walking in the center of God's will. We're committing our lives. We're committing ourselves to the will of God. Heard about a little boy one time was out on a lake or on the edge of a lake and he had a little sailboat. And there a gust of wind came along and blew that sailboat way beyond his reach. The little boy started crying 
because he couldn't retrieve the little sailboat. By that time, his big brother came, and he saw what happened. And so he reaches down, and he picks up some rocks, and he starts throwing rocks at the sailboat. And the little boy, his brother, couldn't understand what in the world was he doing. And just a little while, he happened to notice he was throwing the rocks on the other side of the sailboat, which caused the ripple to bring the sailboat back to him. Have you ever noticed that that's what God does sometimes in, in periods of storms and sufferings? When we find ourselves kind of drifting away, that he allows a storm or a, a period of suffering. And it looks like he's throwing those pebbles right at us when all along he's just drawing us closer and closer and closer back to him. Amen. My friend, I want you to know that's what God's intention is for your life. I'm so grateful to know that he loves us enough that he cares for us, that when he finds us drifting, 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 drifting away, that he won't let us go too far without bringing us back. So what am I supposed to do? I'm to commit my life to him. When I find myself in the period of suffering, I should be not saying, Lord, why? But I should be asking, Lord, what are you trying to teach me? What are you trying to do in my life? Here it is. Use it. And not only commit my life, but continue doing good. You know what happens a lot of times when we find ourselves in a period of suffering? We want to quit on God. When a trouble or a trial or a situation comes into our life, the first thing we want to do is quit praying, quit witnessing, quit coming to church. Here's a, here's a couple. They have an argument with one another, and they throughout the week, and they decide that they're just angry at each other and they're not going to speak to each other. And instead of going to church that Sunday, they said, we're not going to be a hypocrite. We're going to stay out of church. Well, the very place they need to be is in church. A man experiencing great amount of temptation. Temptation. And the devil whispers in his ear, tells him how sorry he is. And what a hypocrite he is. He says, well, I'm just not going to go to church and be a hypocrite. The very place he needs to be is in church. Continue to keep on keeping on. When you don't feel like praying, you know what you need to do? You need to pray. Pray, I remember Stephen Ofer saying many years ago, pray when you feel like it. Pray when you don't feel like it. Pray until you do feel like it. Amen. And I've never forgotten that. There's a lot of times I would get ready to pray, and I just didn't feel like praying. But I would try, and I'd pray, and I would ask the Lord to help me. And before long, after I... As I start getting up off of my knees, I began to think, boy, I'm sure glad I prayed today. Felt his presence, recognized his, his presence. And prayer seemed to help soothe the wound. Sometimes we get to a point we don't want to read the Bible. We get to feeling sorry for ourselves. We 
find ourselves in a pity party and start, oh me, oh my. You need to continue on doing good. Keep on going to church. Keep on reading that Bible. Keep on praying. Keep on serving the Lord. And my friend, eventually, you're going to find yourself where God wants you to be in the first place. I want to ask you a question today. How do you handle suffering? Are you a good sufferer or not? I'm afraid most of us are not. But Paul says, count it worthy. Peter says, don't think it's strange when you find yourself in a fiery trial. Because God has a plan. He has a purpose. And the only way that he's going to fulfill that plan and that purpose in your life is for you to go through a period of suffering. And one of these days, praise be to God, we'll understand it in the better by and by. Amen? Amen. Lord Jesus, thank you for reminding us through your word Reminding us that suffering is a part of the Christian life and that you have a plan and a purpose to purify us, to identify us, and to glorify us. Help us, dear Lord, to be found faithful. As I think about the faithfulness, I think about your faithfulness there on the cross. And there on the cross, you gave a perfect example of enduring the pathway of suffering to the goal of glory. Help us, dear Lord. I No doubt I'm talking to someone right now that who has a heavy heart. I'm talking to someone that saying, Pastor, what you said is certainly what I'm going through today. Lord, I pray that you will minister to them. Help them. And give them grace. Lord, there may be someone here today that is lost. It's never come to a point of salvation. Never come to the place of recognizing that Christ is Lord of their life. And that through suffering, He has brought them to that place. I pray that today that they'll step out and give their heart and their life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, dear Lord, we commit this moment to you. May Christ be glorified, for we ask this in Jesus' name.